Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. Welcome to the newest episode of Film Circuit Breakdown. I am with, screen, with director, writer, and Night of the Living Dead co-creator, John Russo. How are you doing tonight, John? Well, very good, Ian. How are you? Um, I'm doing very well. I'm, I've got to say, usually I don't have... I've gotten pretty good about not geeking out during interviews, but I am genuinely excited to, to have you on the show. Well, thanks. I'll do my best. All right, so... um. I want I want to get right to it. For those who don't know, you know we've you know we've talked a little bit about who you are. We introduced you, but for those who don't know, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> okay, my name's John Russo, and I was uh, co-writer of Night of the Living Dead, and uh, that kind of started my career and George Romero's career and and so on. And uh, since then, I've uh, uh, had. Uh, 20-some books published, and I've made about 20 movies, um, and I've done all kinds of things, including uh, teaching my own movie-making programs and uh, lecturing at different colleges and universities, and uh, even right now, I'm, uh, I've, uh, I'm writing a Civil War documentary, which Russ Strider and I are co-producing and co-directing, and... Uh, Russ was the producer on Night of the Living Dead and played Johnny, the um, the uh, snotty brother who says they're coming to get you, Barbara. That's his, fam- his uh, famous line. Now, here's a question. Can you say it in the Johnny voice? Can I say it in the Johnny voice? I can try. They're coming to get you, Barbara. That was awesome. I don't think I've ever done that before. All right, so show's over. Yeah, no, no, we actually <laughs> do have a full fledged interview. All right, so um, starting off with Night of the Living Dead, a lot of people, even you know, even when it first came out, didn't realize the uh, independent nature of the movie. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the production for those of our listeners who may know and heard the story before and maybe not know? Well, um, George Romero, Russ Strider, and I met when we were uh, about, we were each about 18 years old. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area. Russ was, grew up in Pittsburgh. And, and George came to Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon. So George was a fine arts major, but he wanted to make movies. His father uh, did um was an artist who worked on a lot of movie campaigns in New York, and George grew up with movie banners and posters and standees all around him. So uh, he was the one that said that we could make movies. And we had all kind of dabbled with it, uh, you know, as kids uh, shooting little eight millimeter things and so on. But we all got bitten by the movie bug, and uh, George... uh, got some money from his uncle, about 2000 bucks. that's all, and they started making a film called Expostulations, which was a series of comic vignettes, and they were pretty good, it was, uh, and I, I wasn't part of that because by that time I was at West Virginia University, and I would work on, with them on that, when I say I wasn't part of it, I kind of was because I'd work on it during uh, uh, vacation breaks from college and, and during the summers. The film never got a soundtrack on it. We ran out of money, so uh, George and Russ were left with a Bolex, 16mm Bolex camera, and they thought, well, maybe we can make commercials or some, some other kinds of films and try to build up to the point where we can actually do a feature. So at that point, Point. I had graduated from college and worked as a teacher for a short while and got drafted. So I was on my way into the Army, and they said, if we're doing well, then when you get out of the Army, come and work with us. Well, I really wanted to do that, and that dream kind of kept me going through the next two years. And not long after I got out of the Army, I taught for a while, worked with George and Russ on the side, and then I joined them full-time. A year and a half later, we made Night of the Living Dead. 
but that was after killing us ourselves, you know, going three, four days without sleep regularly, working on all kinds of commercials and sales films and political uh, spots and what, you name it, we did it. And uh, we struggled and, uh, you know, all, plowed all the money back into buying equipment and uh, moved to a, a bigger studio. And it was still small, but bigger. And, and then, uh, one day we were, uh, George and I were having lunch with Richard Ritchie, who was part of the expostulations group. And it was not working for an ad agency that we worked for on beer commercials and so, so on. And we're eating grilled provolone sandwiches and drinking beer at a restaurant around we're having lunch, you know, around, around the corner from our studio, and we were bitching, George and I, about the fickleness of our clients, that when they wanted a good job for cheap, they came to us, and they always promised to come back with, with bigger budget stuff, but, but as soon as they got bigger budgets, they went to New York or Hollywood, and uh, we, we I, Richard said, well, why don't you do something about it, you don't just bitch about it, and I said, well, why don't we make a horror film? You know, we should be able to do a better job than what we see on late night uh, spook shows. So I said, if 10 of us would kick in 600 bucks each, we'd have $6,000. We might be able to shoot 35 millimeter black and white, print it down to 16 millimeter for editing and so on, editing and mixing, because we had all 16 millimeter mixing and editing gear at that point. And, uh, most of our cameras were 16 millimeter, but we had just gotten a, a, a 35 millimeter blimped uh, uh, Aeroflex, and so that's that's what we did. Richard said, "You're crazy." George said, "We're going to make a movie." Got all excited, slammed his fist on the table, and all the beer bottles and glasses rattled, and everybody stared at us. And that was the start of uh, what became Night of the Living Dead. Now it's kind of funny you mentioned the um yeah you mentioned you talk about your commercial work and one of the big things that always stuck out for me for Night of Living Dead especially considering the limited constraints the uh, limited constraints on the budget of the movie was that whenever they showed the new the news segments they always felt very authentic like in the way that they were shot the way that the news reporter reported the news and I always wondered if that was an influence on that well, you know, everything we did was an influence on it. We had done so much of that stuff, and we knew what it was all about. We knew what the news looked like, and you know, and, and we knew uh, we knew what TV commercials looked like. We, we we were very familiar with everything about television at that time, and what it was supposed to feel like, what it did feel like. So we, you know, we aimed for that kind of reality, and. You know, we we aimed for reality throughout the making of the movie, the writing and everything else. You know, the idea was that it, once you accepted the outlandish premise that the dead could come back to life and that they would be flesh eaters, which, by the way, both of those were my ideas, who, who they would be, that they would be dead people after human flesh. And... and uh, uh, but we wanted uh, the people, given that outlandish premise, we wanted people to behave like normal normal people would if such a thing actually happened. We wanted it to be believable. And uh, so that's what we strive for. And we wanted it, to, I kept saying, we it had to have the impact of, uh, at that time, one of the best films I had seen in the horror genre was uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original one. Mm-hmm. And that just picture knocked me out and shocked people. And they came out of the theater with shocked looks on their faces, and that's what I was striving for. So, <clears throat> you look at the um, cultural influence that the um, Night of Living Dead has had, and, you know, it really has made an impact in a lot of different mediums. And for me, growing up as a kid in the 90s, the biggest influ- the a lot of the major influences I saw was on the Resident Evil games, to the point where George actually directed one of the commercials for Resident Evil 2. And in Resident Evil 4, there is a direct tribute where they go into this into this cabin, you know, into this house, this two-story house, that has all the villagers and zombies, like, bursting in on the inside as they're trying to defend uh-huh. themselves inside the home. Um, 
What do you think of the influence, of, the influence and the impact that Night of the Living Dead has made on the genre, not just in film, but in video games, comic books like The Walking Dead, and television? Well, it's gratifying to have had that impact. I never, never, uh, I don't play video games. At one point, I got in, into learning more about them and seeing what they're all about because uh, students at, at, at Carnegie Mellon, the students and staff, were making a Night of the Living Dead video game, and it was looking great, and then they somehow dropped it. So, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, it, you know, as far as the influence of Night of the Living Dead, I was thinking about it today. I don't dwell on it a lot, but today it was. I was thinking, well, you know, it's made its mark all over the place, and not just in film, and not not just in the genre, but it does permeate the society. I guess um, I probably thought of it because my wife put on my desk an article that I haven't read yet, but I glanced at it, and it's in uh, what is it? In? It's from ew.com, what is that? News and Notes. It's a Newsweek-like magazine, I guess. All I have is the reptile page. And the article said, says the, the jogging dead. Uh, trend alert. Athletic walking dead fans can now test their ability to outrun reanimated ghouls in a series of 5K... Obstacle course zombie races called Run for Your Lives, which will be held across the country this year. So, uh, this is something new to me, but things are happening all the time, like zombie walks all over the place, and we've participated in them. I mean, me, George, and Russ, uh, about a year and a half or two years, well, maybe two years ago now, Russ and I were grand marshals of the zombie walk in Toronto which started out eight years before with eight people. And when we were grand marshals there, there were 10,000 people in the square top, square right in the middle of Toronto. And they were, it was shoulder-to-shoulder shoulder zombies and, uh, you know, everybody having a good time. And, and, you know, we've done that in Asbury Park and Pittsburgh and a whole bunch of places where people try to break the Guinness Book of World Records by having a huge number of zombies show up for their event. So, you, you know, you can't kind of escape this movie. It's been on screen somewhere for 45 years and still going. And uh, I don't think there's any other movie like that that even gone with when they bring it out now and then and, you know, plays on the AMC or Turner Classic Movies or whatever. But Night of the Living Dead is somewhere every day. <laughs> So, it is quite a phenomenon. Like you said, it really is amazing how the movie has grown, how the cult phenomenon has just kept growing and growing and growing, and the fact that the film has gone from, went from a cult, run from a small cult film to just something completely iconic. And, um, but what I wanted to ask you was actually, the history of how you guys actually first showed the movie in theaters and how you got it there. Well, um, when the film was finished in around May of, of 1967, we, George Romero and Russ Steiner, drove to New York with the film in the trunk of their car to show it not in regular theaters, but to show it to potential buyers, distributors, and day that they left to do that, Martin Luther King was assassinated and the cities were in flames and so on, and here they were going to uh, New York with a film in which the black hero was shot by uh, the, the, uh, was the, the cops or vigilantes and the, who, were, who were called uh, rednecks by some people, but we never said they were rednecks, they were just people going out and doing what law enforcement and vigilantes would do if the dead came back to life. They were gunning them down and trying to save people's lives. It was a total accident that they shot Ben and they would have shot him whether he was white, black, or yellow. So so that would, that we were not making any kind of political statement with that. So the, the, we didn't hand carry the 
picture to theaters to screen it for and sell tickets. We wanted to get a distributor, and we eventually did. And so the picture opened in Pittsburgh in, in about 17 theaters. It was a huge hit right from the start. And it went, then it started moving from city to city, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, everywhere it went, it did huge numbers. So it's a total myth that the, that the picture didn't take off till later and became a so-called cult movie. The distributor spread that myth to try to ex get, <laughs> because they were ripping us off for tons of money and they were trying to disguise that fact. So the movie always was a hit that made lots of money from the start. Unfortunately, most of it was stolen by the distributor and, and, and to this day we're still fighting those kinds of battles. So um, the, the phenomenon never really quit. It's, you know, for... Some people think that it only, this whole thing about ghouls and and, and, and zombies and the, all these kinds of movies developed over the years, but that's false. Um, Night of the Living Dead made a great impression on people, including aspiring filmmakers right from the jump. And that's why, you know, Sam Raimi, for example, Rob Tappert, and um, uh, that group of people from, from uh, uh, Michigan, uh, they, they wanted to make comedies, but when they saw Night of the Living Dead, they thought, oh, if we could come up with something like this, it could jumpstart our career. So they, uh, uh, they switched gears and made the Evil Dead. So it, 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 the same thing happened with Toby Hooper. I mean, he made Texas Chainsaw Massacre after he saw Night of the Living Dead, and he was looking for an idea that might, might, make his career take off so so it just the thing is uh, for, an, for aspiring filmmakers uh, you know usually you don't have much money and you're not going to have a cast of thousands and lavish special effects and you're not going to do a historical film or a, or a something that requires saucers and landing and, and going to outer space and all that kind of stuff and, and, and name actors and everything that Hollywood has but anybody can do ghoul makeups and you can have uh, you can do a zombie film inexpensively and if you come up with a good strong idea or a new approach then then you might have it on your hands and you might just, you might jump start your career so really that's the reason for it and and the, and also the fact that it it really grabbed people's imaginations right from the start and the, you know I always say that uh, um, zombies weren't heavyweight fright material like werewolves or, or vampires. They just, they never even impressed me as a kid. I didn't care about zombies. I mean, they shambled around and tried to choke somebody or throw somebody against the wall, but they weren't scary. When we made them flesh eaters, that's what did the trick. You know, all of a sudden, you know, it pushed them into another, into a whole new uh, dimension. You had to be afraid of them, and they, had, they just tapped into the whole fear we have all through human history of being devoured. You know, we were we were prey for wild beasts through millions of years of evolution, our evolution. So I think um, this, uh, the zombie thing taps into that kind of uh, ingrained atavistic fear, and so that's that's one of the secrets of, of why it moves people. So it. it to that extent, I think I think now that the genre will never die. It'll be like vampires. You know, vampire the vampire myths have the same kind of effect on people. And there's always vampire films. And there's something really creepy about people with fangs and you know going after other people. And if you if you uh, you can turn into one of them, so that that increases the fear. Um, one of the one of the main th one of the two main things I wanted to bring up, I wanted to ask about the um, the kind of interesting way that you and that you and Romero that you and Romero split up the rights for the films, like split up the rights to the uh, different names, and the things that came with that, like Escape of the Living Dead, the Night of the Living Dead comic books that you did with Avatar and Return of the Living Dead, and then I also wanted to 
go into a little bit go into a little bit about the thir- the kind of controversial uh, 30th anniversary release. Well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that makes me laugh. It's a 30th anniversary controversy. That's bullshit. But uh, the uh, basically, George and I both have rights because we 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 co-authored the screenplay. So you know, we we I said to George, uh, we made some attempts to to maybe do a sequel together, and then that didn't work out for one reason or another. So what I we ended up signing an agreement where I gave him the right to do Dawn of the Dead. We read each other's scripts. I told him I gave him the right to do Dawn of the Dead and call it a sequel, and he gave me the right to pursue Return of the Living Dead, but not to call it a sequel. So that's that's it. It's very simple. And so we went our separate ways, raising money for our separate projects. And uh, that's it. As far as the uh, the uh, you know, I wrote a, 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 a major article for Film Rage about 30th anniversary edition. And basically, uh, there were people who were going to do their own 30th anniversary edition without uh, Arrow Films was going to do do one. And so to protect ourselves, we had, we we figured we better do it. So we got two hundred thousand dollars from Anchor Bay, and uh, George was going to uh, direct it, and we were both going to write the new scenes. We had promised him about eighteen minutes of new scenes, so. That was the deal, and then George got tied up with some other project, and I ended up writing and directing the new scene. So, uh, the uh, but there are people out there that think that only George has the right to tamper with so-called tamper with Night of the Living Dead, and that, and then they think they're protecting George by bitching at me, and, and they're they're. It's totally goofy in my estimation. You know, George, at that time, these kinds of these kinds of things were being done. George Lucas did it. it was Star Wars. And it's, when I submitted the thing that we... We were very careful, too. A large part of the money went to re... Uh, most of the money was used to uh, re-digit, to digitize and remaster the original Night of the Living Dead, which we didn't touch. It's still there in its entirety, but it's but it's remastered and looks a lot better than it ever looked. And the other thing is that I didn't really mess with the movie that much. I did a I did a prologue and an epilogue, and the best way to not mess with a movie is to is to do a prologue and an epilogue. You know? So yeah, I cut a few things out of the. The short and Judy O'Day speech, which rambled on too long anyway, we fixed the jump cut that was in the film for years, and George said there was no way to fix it, but Bill Heisman actually came up with a way to fix it, and we did. So the, uh, the main point is that Russ Steiner and I are trustees of Image 10 Inc., and George is a shareholder, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholder, the original shareholders. If somebody comes along and wants to pay two hundred thousand dollars, and the shareholders can make some money after all the ripoffs, and we are obligated to do that. So, uh, uh, you know, I, a lot of these people that bitch and moan and, 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 at me, and, you know, I like to ask them if somebody, if they had a successful movie and somebody offered them two hundred thousand dollars to do a a. a in addition with a few minutes of new scenes, then then would they turn it down? I don't think so. They'd be stupid if they did, especially if they have an investors. They might get into a lawsuit from their investors if they turn down such a deal. So I just say, bullshit, shut the fuck up, and leave me alone. You know what? I can totally understand that. I mean, I am, I'm kind of split in my opinion on the new scenes, but I really did my her the remastering work that was done in the film. But, you know, at the same time, you know, when somebody, in my opinion, when someone like yourself has worked on such an iconic film, um, you know, if people do have an issue with with some piece of work, they have to remember the fact that you are one of the, that you and George created the movie. It's not like somebody else is going in there and saying, oh, I'm going to put these scenes in someone else's movie. It's your film, and, you know, the idea of an epilogue a prologue and an epilogue is definitely more 
is definitely much better and much less jarring than what was done with something like the um, Star Wars, like the uh, Star Wars trilogy, like we talked about earlier, where they just threw scenes into the movie. I yeah, think... we didn't do that. The, exactly. We had the prologue and the epilogue. We actually, if, if anybody was sane about it, it, it flows better. And we also tried to do things that we wanted to do and discussed uh, back when we made the original movie. For instance, we worried about where do all these zombies come from? There's this house out in the middle of nowhere, so where where do they come from? You know, so we actually showed a car wreck and people uh, people in that car. We had we had uh, the uh, waitress with the Beekman's Diner uh, emblem on her on her shirt. You know, we so we showed that the Beekman's Diner was actually close enough that the that the, the zombies that were surrounding that house could have come from there. So this was, and one of the problems is, and people sometimes bitch about the music. Well, we got that was uh, that was something beyond our control. That uh, you know, Anchor Bay wanted to do a new score, and I went to the lab and found the you know to get a uh, to document what materials were there, and we had a M and E mix, a music and effects mix there which you need because you're going to replace, uh, you know, you're going to replace the existing music with new music, not on the original version, but on the new version. And uh, and it turned out to be mislabeled and, and it was lost. I called almost every country in the world that the picture played, trying to find a clean uh, a mix that would have just the voice, you know, where I could take out the original music that would have the voice and the uh, effects on on two separate tracks, and then we could, and it didn't exist. And so Vlad Lechina, who was doing the new music, had to work with with what he had. And there were a lot of places where we couldn't take out the old music, and we had to kind of blend in new music because that's what Anchor Bay had been promised. So these kinds of things, uh, somebody apparently in some foreign country when they admit Post, did a post up version never never returned the uh, the Yemeni mix to the to the to the lab so to, to to the United States so it's lost forever as far as I know so those those kind of things happen but I actually I've talked to people who never saw anything but the 30th anniversary edition surprisingly enough and they actually liked it so they come up to me at conventions and tell me. And uh, I think that if we had both versions to look at in 68, we probably would have released the 30th anniversary edition because it was the version that fixed the jump cut, shortened that overly long blathering speech and did other other things that, that you know, and, and like I said, explained where the zombies came from and so on and so on and so on. We would have probably gone in favor of that, that kind of logic. Uh, but who knows? It's a moot point. Exactly. Um, well, you know, when it was done, the head buyer, the buyer at uh, Baker Bay, Doug, um, what's his name, Doug? Uh, I can't think of it, but, you know, he called me and said, you know, you've accomplished something that very few filmmakers have done. He said, George, uh, 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 Lucas did it with Star Wars, and now you've done it with Night of the Living Dead. He said the new scenes are seamless, and you know he said he said I'm a fan of the movie, and I, you know, and I've watched it a hundred times, and I can't tell where the old scenes leave off and the new scenes begin, which we did. We matched the look and quality of it. You know that was carefully done, and, it, and, and, and but, it, but it was done. So a lot of the complainers have no idea of any of this. Now, moving into um, the Night of the Living Dead comic books that you helped write, and the and the film Return of the Living Dead. Um, first, in regards to the Night of the Living Dead comic books, how did that project come about, and what how how's it what how did that project come about, and how was working in the comic field similar and different to working on the Night of the Living Dead movie? Uh, well, the uh, when you're 
you're working on a movie, you're involved with everything all the way, and it's a lot of hard work, and it's very grueling and so and demanding with the comic books. I write the stories, they do the adaptions, and somebody else does the illustrations, and, you know, we had a pretty good working relationship, and we, you know, Escape, Escape of the Living Dead was done as a five-part comic, and we made the top ten nationally, and it spawned, so far, ten sequels and two graphic novels, so it was pretty successful, and then, uh, I was instrumental in getting George Romero a deal with Avatar, for a Night of the Living Dead comics, and he asked me to do the writing side. So for a long time, I was writing them, and now I'm not real happy with them because they, uh, they they're kind of high-handed at this point. They just uh, the other people there are writing my coattails and uh, you know trying to make a name for themselves. By I was like stunned when the comics came out; they didn't even have my name on the cover. I never heard of such a thing. And I've never heard of people taking something that's not theirs, that's mine, and just going their own direction with it. I wrote a whole lot of the stories in the beginning, and people liked them. So I'd write the stories, and they'd adapt them, and that was that was good. But from after that point, I'm not real happy with Avatar. That is really unfortunate to hear. Because um, in the last few years, I've become a big fan of writers like Warren Ellis. And I end up picking up a lot of the work from Avatar. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about continuing with them, but obviously now hearing this, that's definitely not something that's going to happen. No, well, it's up to them. I never know what the hell they're going to do. Half the time they do things, and I, I, if I wouldn't see some of the stuff at conventions, I wouldn't even know it's been done. <laughs> you know, there's, again, like I said, this high-handedness. So at the first, I thought that... Uh, this is a good, honest company and good to work with, but like everybody else, they get greedy and, and uh, so on. So <clears throat> now, regarding Return of the Living Dead, um, in your like, how involved were you in the actual in the actual story and in, in the actual script and film production of the movie? I mean, I know you wrote read, wrote the book, but um, a lot of people don't know that there are definitely some. Li- Definitely some differences between the film adaptation and the result story. Well, the original script, um, Rudy Ritchie and I mostly wrote. R- Russ Striner, Rudy Ritchie, and I came up with the ideas, most of which were mine again. You know, I'm the kind of person, I have ten ideas to everybody else's one, and that's why I've got twenty-some books published. And so on. So, you know, so Rudy took a crack at the script, and uh, then... You know, I did. I, I revised it and uh, and uh, rewrote it, and then uh, I was I was uh, did you know took the lead in the negotiations and the sale of it and all that, and uh, and and uh, then at one point I was supposed to direct it, and, and then um, and I brought Toby Hooper into it at another point, and he was going to direct it, just scrambling for trying to get it financed and made. And then uh, Tom Fox, the producer, uh, wanted to buy us out and make the movie his way, he said. So he paid us a lot of money and we sold it. And um, and, uh, then they hired down about Ryan and Emdale said that uh, horror is dead, you can't make a horror film, which is never true in my estimation. And so they hired down about to turn it into a horror comedy, and then I novelized his script, so that's how it happened. Uh, at one point in 1976, Frank Sinatra was going to finance the movie with me directing, and I was brought out to Caesar's Palace and put up in the Sinatra wing there, and we met with, I had already known, I already knew most of the people in that organization, so and they liked me. So they set it up, and we met with Jilly and met with Mickey Rudin, who was Frank Sinatra's attorney, and everything's going swimmingly. And we have tickets to the opening night party and the, and the show, and then his mother's plane went down to the mountains that night, and she was killed, and the deal never went through. So that's, you know, part of the twists and turns and the freaky story of Return of the Living Dead. Now, you know, just looking at, looking at it now, looking at it objectively, what do you think of the film as it is, like the final product? I thought the film was great. You know, 
I thought Dan did a hell of a job, and he thought I did a hell of a job novelizing his script, and he was a good guy and nice to work with, and I think the cast uh, did a great job. And uh, I love the documentary, More Brains, and uh, which was produced by Tommy Hudson, and my segment of it was shot by, by my one of my best friends, Rob Lucas, and... Um, and uh, Tommy said, I, I saved the documentary. I rescued the whole thing. I said, well, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> I said, those people did a great job. You know, <laughs> the people, the actors, actresses, and everybody connected with the film, because I didn't work on the production. And they, what he what he meant was that I was the only person still alive who knew all the intricacies of, of, of the of, of the up of the thing and all it got sold in the twists and turns of that so that's why I'm, I figure extensively in the documentary in the first 40-45 minutes of it but it, I wouldn't say that I saved the whole doc been a great documentary even if that stuff wasn't touched on I think one of, the, one of the things like one of the things that still stands out to me in that movie <clears throat> is the um is the makeup work, especially with the tar monster, especially with the tar zombie. That, I mean... Yeah, that was great stuff. And, you know, by the way, uh, right around that time, uh, we, uh, I knew Jimmy Karen for a long time, you know, almost from Chump, because he narrated a documentary called, uh, called uh, Driving Madness that we uh, produced through my company at the time. Tim Ferranti was the main producer, another friend of mine, and we, uh, so he, he, Tim got Jimmy to narrate, and like, we used to see him at conventions and so on, R really nice guy, and so I knew him, but I had never met Clue Collier, but I liked Clue's work, and, but I finally did meet him in Chicago, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Jim's, Jimmy Karen's about 95 now, and Clues went up there. He was there with his son. I think his name's John. He's a director, too. But the funny thing is, uh, Bill Mosley and I were, were, were singing these funny songs, party songs, and Clue loved it. <laughs> so every night when he'd come into the restaurant, he'd look for me or for Bill. <laughs> and he said, I'm glad I have somebody to hang out with. So... You know, that was nice after all those years to meet him and then, you know, get along very well with him. I, I got to say, you mentioned uh, Mosley. Um, he's definitely one of those people. I think a lot of people don't realize how genuinely nice he is until they meet him in person. Because you see him playing just the most horrific people you could think of. And then you see him in yeah. person. Yeah. And he gives, and he's the one giving people hugs at conventions. He's, uh... Yeah, he's a singer too. He's been, he's got a band and, uh, you know, I didn't know he was taking singing lessons for 18 years, he said. We started, we were at the Metallica event in, uh, you know, the Orion Festival about two years ago in, um, in, uh, I think this May, it would, I think it's two years. And, um, that's where we start singing these Tom Lehrer songs, they're party songs from a long time ago, and I was surprised he knew them, and I remembered some of them. And so we started, we, we, we did, on the shuttle bus from the hotel to the island, we, we, he started singing one of them, and I joined in harmonizing, and people were getting a big kick out of it. So, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a lot of fun and very talented. Do you realize what we need to do now, right, John? We need to get you. We need to get this started. We need to start John and Bill singing the party song hits <laughs> for five CDs or yeah, seven hundred fifty-two well, tapes. <laughs> could it could happen? I guess <clears throat> that that would be the but greatest thing. Also, you know, I mean, we cast him in the, the Night of the Living Dead remake. I, that's no, one. But, sorry. Yeah, we. I think we maybe gave his career a jump when we cast him in the Night of the Living Dead remake and he played the Johnny character. But I didn't get to hang out with him much then because Russ Dreyer and I were busy every day trying to keep the money flowing and not have the production shut down. So there were so many problems with that production. So I didn't get to know Bill very well until later. 
so that's kind of funny. I mean, you work on a movie, you're working 18, 20 hours a day, and, you know, if you're, um, I don't, I don't remember how many days he had on camera during that movie, but it might not have been very many, and we just didn't get to hang out. That, that was it. I, I gotta say, as somebody who, I always tell people that the Night of the Living Dead remake is one of the few examples of a remake that truly works. And as a fan, I'm so glad that you guys were able to get that done, especially with the difficulties you were talking about. Now, I know with that movie, you you and Tom, uh, that was, it wasn't, was it Tom Savini's directorial premiere, or had he directed a film before then? No, I think that was his first feature film, I think. Now, what was that like, working with somebody like Tom? Because Tom is very much a, he's a very, like, when you meet him, he's very much a, um... I I wouldn't like to use the term alpha in regards to his personality, but um, he's definitely got a very strong personality. And how is that working with, um, you know, working with Tom Savini compared to working with George or um, O'Bannon in the um, Night of the Living Dead or Return of the Living Dead? Uh, well, Tom had a lot of great ideas, and he had some ideas that, you know, didn't work, and... Uh, you know, we uh, recently we had a big discussion about the whole thing, and I was able to tell him some of the problems I had because he thought that it was my fault that, uh, that you know it was my job to get the R rating, and we had to get an R rating because George and Russ and I were signed to a five million dollar bond, and if Columbia turned the picture down, we'd be stuck for the five million. So, we, the getting an R was absolutely a, a necessity, and. Uh, so I had to do that, and then, so that meant that the MPAA was forcing us to take some of the blood splatter out, a lot of the blood splatter, so a lot of the shots, uh, you know, not a whole lot of shots, but it bugged Tom, because he was the creator of them, you know, he, he loves the special effects stuff, and zombies getting shot in the head, and, and then uh, uh, the blood flying, and then the MPAA saying, can't show the blood flying. You have to just show the the, uh, the the bullet hitting. You know, the, and that's it. Well, if you chop it down, then you don't have any shot left. Uh, it could have been directed a different way, and there would have been shot left, uh, but it wasn't. You know, a zombie would drop out of frame, get hit, blood fly, and a zombie drop out of the frame, and it would take only a split second for that to happen. So if you cut the splatter out, you only have yeah, <laughs> you know, a quarter second of the song be getting hit, and that won't cut. So then the whole shot has to go. So that was the problem, and I think Tom was felt very good about realizing some of that stuff and realizing the problems that Russ and I were having with 21st century films and the and the cash flow problem. Uh, and and then you know because of that, a lot of times. You know, George was work, went away to work on the dark half, uh, he, to write the script for dark half, so he wasn't there. Russ and I were there, but we weren't in, a lot of times, in the farmhouse when the shooting was going on, because we were on the phone with 21st Century, trying our best to keep the cash flow coming, or else the production would have shut down and the film never would have gotten finished. So, I think uh, a couple months ago, convention, Rob, Lucas, and Tom and I had this great discussion where we all commiserated with each other with, uh, concerning our, our various problems that, you know, that may not have been fully understood by everyone, but now it is, so that's, that's uh, Rob told me later, he said, I love that conversation, so a lot of air was cleared, so that's the way it went. It's... You know, it is frustrating. You're talking, you know, you were talking about the battle with the studio. Says they kept wanting to get the R rating. They kept wanting to cut it to get that R rating. And you know, you you bring in someone like you bring in someone like Savini. You know, you bring in someone like you. You bring in someone like Romero. And it's like let them make their movie. And the worst part is you look at Hollywood now, and the obsession for a while at least with the PG thirteen rating. And when, it, and when a movie like, I think it was, was it Ghost House or something that came out with Jennifer Lawrence, probably her only bad film that she's done so far, um, comes out and has a horror film that's so tame 
that you can't see a scene where someone is being stabbed with a knife in the movie. Uh-huh. And I think in many ways, the the lack of success of the attempt at the PG-13 horror remake has thankfully uh-huh. given you know producers and directors that little nudge to realize, you know, you can have that gore. You know, horror... You know, there are horror fans who are, there are more horror movies that are made for suspense, uh, psychological implied situations. But there are also horror movies that, where that gore is kind of a necessity. Um, what, what do you think of the way that horror films have become now and what they're starting to become again? Well, I don't see a whole lot of them. I, on purpose. I mean, I, I never was a movie collector. For one thing, I have to keep all the elements and, things and manuscripts of my stuff and that drives me out of the house but uh, I don't want to be influenced by other people's ideas there's too much of everybody in Hollywood looking at everybody else's work and thinking they can just change it around a little bit and you know but I want my stuff to be unique and original so I don't need to see a whole every horror film that comes out in order to know how to make a movie or write a script you know, it's it's a pro- the process has been the same for ever since the beginning of movies. So, so I if there's a special reason or I really want to see a certain thing, then I'll do it. But like 28 days later, the reason I went to see that is because I was using Canon XL1 cameras in my movie workshop, and I wanted to see what the blow up looked like because maybe I would shoot something that I'd want to blow up. And I liked the movie a lot. And uh, especially at the beginning of the kind of last half hour fell apart, I thought. It was kind of dumb. You know, they ran out of ideas or something. But nevertheless, it's a pretty good movie. And uh, so, I, you know, I basically, yeah, I, I mean, I stay away from a lot of the stuff. I don't want to have to wonder, would I have had that idea if I didn't see somebody else's thing? I don't want to have to second guess myself. If I if it comes out of my head, then I don't have to second guess anything. That you know, in, in many ways, that definitely makes perfect sense. Um, before before you well, bring, it works for me. <laughs> exactly. Um, before we bring the interview to a close, um, what work do you have coming out that your fan that your fans should know about? Well, I'm, I'm very active in uh, tons of stuff. I think I mentioned Russ and I are doing a Civil War documentary, which we think it's called American Towns at War, and it it, it deals with uh, Brookville, Pennsylvania, and Falmouth, Virginia during the Civil War because they're they were uh, they were uh, uh, you know <laughs> rivals, <laughs> but but a lot of troops from uh, Brookville fought down and. Fredericksburg and Falmouth and, uh, and so on. Um, but that's just to say that you know, we don't just do uh, horror. Uh, and we always have done all kinds of things besides horror. So, But as far as me, um, I have a book out now. Uh, my publisher, my main publisher is, is Burning Ball Press. Gary Vincent is the president and we've become really good friends. So he published my book, Dealey Plaza. One reviewer called it the Great American Murder Novel. It's not a horror novel, but it deals with the uh, 60 years of, of, of violence and, and gun violence and every other kind of violence, mass shootings and left-wing and right-wing uh, violence that's, that was unleashed in this country, you know, with 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 the Kennedy assassination. So right now we have 18 five-star reviews on Amazon and four four-star reviews and not, no negatives. And so it's, it's, it's really a worthwhile book. And Gary is, but Gary is also uh, republishing my backlist. And so already done I, uh, is um, The Awakening, which I made into a movie called Heart Starver with Tom Savini in the lead role. Uh, and, uh, then I, I, he, one of the daycare was republished under the title, uh, The Academy, Living Things, I'm proofreading now. And, but if you go on my website, johnrussoentertainment.com, johnrussoentertainment.com, you'll see 
the movies and books and everything. And you can buy them there if you wish. And you can see a lot of things about all the different sections of the website about what I'm into now. There's even, there's a, uh, uh, a thing that I, when I was at the Kirk Hammett's Fear Fest Evil in San Francisco in February, while I was there, the Epics Channel shot a thing of me as a zombie. And, uh, and I'm actually writing a script right now called My Uncle John is a Zombie. It's a horror comedy. And I'm going to play that character in the movie. So take a look at it. It's about a minute and 20 seconds of me as a zombie. And uh, people loved it. And uh, in the epic Mike Ruggiero was, was the uh, uh, one of the buyers at, at Epic. He, he was the producer of this. And he, he said, I knocked it out of the park. So we're going we're gonna to do more of it. Uh... But I had just a ton of things going on all the time. Midnight, we want to remake. We're raising the money for that. We've been raising the money for that. We had the deal fall through when one person who was financing it died right after we had it cast and were ready to shoot. And uh, we have Serena Vincent playing the the uh, head uh, witch in it. It's not supernatural. If anybody knows Midnight, it's not supernatural. But there there are Satanists in the movie. So, and the Gunnar Hansen will be in it, and the rest of the cast are better shut up because things might change. But anyway, just lots of things. Escape of the Living Dead's all tied up with the Hollywood company that won't greenlight it. I think they ran out of money. I don't know what's going on with them. So, you know, just lots of things in the works at all times. And beyond John Russo, you know, beyond John Russo Entertainment, uh, where where can people find you on Facebook? Where can people find you on Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all that stuff. I have a Facebook fan page, and then I don't know how you call it up. I call it up real easy because it's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a regular Facebook page. I have close to five thousand friends climbing. So. Uh, yeah, but if you go on the website, actually, there's a section called uh, Screen Scene, and it lo- has a lot of pictures of me with fans at conventions and so on. And then there's a, a section called News, has um, my Facebook postings and web, my Twitters and so on are reposted there, so you can check all that out. And, um, and, sorry. Well, that's okay, but like I say, you can buy the, you know, the, the, the items that I autograph when you buy them there, and you can buy a lot of stuff on Amazon. Well, a movie I made 10 years ago that never got distributed, but got great reviews. It, it's, uh, there were some problems with music rights, but the Mob Boss and the Soul Singer, you'll see preview trailers on it, and, but it, it got really, really good reviews, and it's a, it's a gangster, uh, uh, kind of a gangster musical about a rock group struggling for years to make it and fighting the Shylocks and the mob and the, their own lives and so on. Then they steal half a million bucks from the Mob Boss and people start to die. But it's the right people that die. So uh, I don't know what else to say. That's lots of stuff. Well, with that, I mean that brings us to the close of our newest episode of Film Circuit Breakdown. Um, I wanted to thank you, John, for coming on the show. This has been a just a huge experience for me, as I'm sure it has for all of our listeners here at here at Circuit Forty Two dot com. Well, thanks a lot. Glad to have uh, been here and talked to you. Good luck to you and to everybody out there listening. And remember, everybody, go to circuit42.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and give us your money because we desperately need it. (laughs) Thank you for coming on again, and this brings us to the close of this episode. Okay, thanks.